Hi there, it's James Chai, and um, oh, I put the wrong date on my thing, but it is actually October 18th, 2019, and I'm just going to switch this as I'm talking, uh, and this is episode 24 that I'm doing. Uh, started September 24th, so it's kind of interesting and cool and all that stuff, and I apologize uh, for running a little bit behind. Um, today I just had a bunch of things that I had to do, I'm trying to make sure that my hair doesn't fall on my face, it's just so... Uh, odd and crazy of me. Um, so there's going to be a few talks. So, uh, I am going to try to choose on what to talk about. I'm going to bring this down here a little bit more so I'm not so far out and everything like that. And there we go. Okay, cool. Very much. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about three possible things again. Well, one is kind of a bit more I don't think I'm going to get to. Like, I keep talking about this one, but I don't bring it up. And that's one about bridges. So I probably won't get to that. Um, but then the other one is in regards to dogs, uh, your dog witnessing a fight, counseling, aftercare, and resetting, as well as the consciousness of a dog, uh, and how they can I'll just close that off here. My alarm goes off every evening at 8.21 uh, p.m. Um, and there's Sammy running around there. Uh, so, okay, so the first one was uh, regards to dog witnessing a fight, counseling, aftercare, and resetting. And then the next one was uh, why dogs are afraid of bridges, uh, relational to their field of vision, logical processing, historical context, and understanding of physics. And then the next one is, uh, is the one in regards to the consciousness of a dog can dismiss things. Dogs wagging uh, the bottom uh, behavior of the tail is, is regards to worry and possession. Uh, and, and the uh, idealism of that's mine and I don't want to lose it as well as contrary to that somewhat in that sense of a conscious prospect and that is that's not mine but I want it and then it's we are all capable we all are capable of being an instant on predator and uh, that because where we came from uh, you know as we evolve and then uh, I might discuss that in regards to shock collar training, uh, resource guarding, and all that. I talked about that yesterday, the other day. Uh, can turn an intelligent dog into a vicious, dangerous dog, uh, especially around guarding aspects of it because uh, it goes from food to toys to other types of possession, territorial possessions as well, uh, as well as to protecting their sense of safety and that contentment on the psychological level for our dogs, as well as makes the next owner at a higher risk of being a victim in regards to that aspect of resource guarding. Uh, especially if it's unknown, and our complicated language makes us less sincere. Um, then dogs can compare size, as well as hackles raising both sides, his conscious, subconscious thinking at the same time, which is a couple of things I talked towards the end of my two-hour uh, session yesterday, uh, um, uh, vlog, I mean, and then, you know, about Zevia and all that stuff. What I may do is uh, just kind of keep it a little bit shorter today. I want to um, get some time on my own, and it's like 8.20 here, 8.30. I want to be able to uh, start working stuff high, and I want to be able to work on some stuff and kind of get a little bit more focus. And uh, yeah, so that's going to be kind of cool. So uh, October 18th, 2019, episode number 24. Um, hey, Mary. So uh, that's kind of cool. When I say hey, Mary, is when I actually see it appear on the screen. So I don't know how much of a delay time there was, Mary. It's just uh, it happens. Um, so sometimes I, I notice that when people are saying things and then I went, oh, what, what are they talking about? Because I've already, you know, and then I watch the video and see what time, when the real time comments come in, Mary, and I'm like 20 seconds behind it already. I'm like, oh, okay. Sorry. A little bit confused. Um, yeah, so we're going to do that part. Hi, Barbara. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring this stuff up here. And I, and I do love the comments and everything, and I apologize to Rita for making it sound like I, was, uh, I wasn't. I was It's just that one day when I was talking about stuff, I just couldn't, I had to concentrate on what I was talking about because I didn't really have my keynotes, uh, pre-notes put up. So there's that. Um, okay, so I am going to go over, and I'm going to talk about, um, yesterday I was talking about dogs fighting, and I, and I kind of go on this for quite a bit in regards to dogs fighting on a regular basis and all that. Um, and I, I'm probably going to talk about that. I, I was going to, th I was thinking about talking about um, when you go on vacation and you, you know, you leave your dog with somebody, etc. And again, everything I talk about is about dysfunctional dogs. It's not about, you know, regular happy-go-lucky dogs that are running around and all that stuff. It's, it's about to do with dogs that are dysfunctional. And that's something that um, a lot of people don't tend to um, 
hear a lot about, right? Because we're always talking about, oh, you know, the dog is this, dog is that, and, you know, something happened and our dog is fine and all that, right? Like even yesterday I talked about having uh, your dog wearing a jacket when it's raining because anybody, just if I wore my t-shirt outside uh, um, and I'm and the rain's coming down on me, even if I wore two, three, four layers of t-shirts and, and sweaters, the rain comes down on me, it's going to make me shivering cold because it's going to wick out all the uh, the temperature from from my body your dog is the same thing even though they have a couple more degrees of temperature they're still going to feel cold no matter what your dog will feel the temperature they understand it. you ever notice that they they can sense the, they can smell heat right they can feel it and they know anybody we can do it too we're walking oh it feels warm you know we'll walk through one of the uh steam uh fed grates uh, underneath the city underneath downtown areas you can feel the heat coming up you know it's warm our dogs know that so instead of just kind of saying well our dog is fine we have to understand that our dog does feel things uh one of the things i kind of i shared something and i don't i didn't want people to think it was a religious thing that i was talking about um you know in that part of it i'm just gonna turn this off here and i don't want people to think that was a religious thing that i was trying to get to um you know a couple things i i shared one was in regards to um mama uh, a chimpanzee uh, that's 59 years of age. This is a, from two years ago. She's obviously passed away two over two years ago. Um, and w one of the uh, behaviors, the scientists that worked with her for several years and all that stuff, uh, Mama is what they called her, um, 59 years old. 59 years old for a chimp. Wow, it's amazing. If our dogs could live that long, I mean, I, I, it would be amazing. Um, that's one thing which was what's really magical and, and I mean it was published two years ago it's got 86 million views that uh, Unilad did uh, did it on the share right because I mean they got a few million vi uh, viewers of uh, uh, followers but it, it shows this care because the scientist uh, I wish I knew what his name was um, but the scientist is is essentially looking uh, coming to visit her mama before she dies and she had stopped eating and just like a human being, you think of that same storyline, right? And all of a sudden, you know, you go to visit your grandma and she's in the hospital and everything. And now she's fine to see you. And then, you know, the, the, the body kind of starts to somewhat force itself into a generation aspect before it falls apart and you die. Um, it's going to be an interesting thing. I always think of that. For those of you who are, who are, who are Star Trek fans, um, I always think of that part where uh, James T. Kirk in the movie... Uh, where he gets killed uh, during the Nexus thing. I, I can't remember which episode it is. I forgive uh, forgive me for not knowing which one it was. Um, and uh, James T. Kirk, he, he gets killed. Kirk gets killed. And as he gets as he gets killed, um, what ends up happening is as he's starting to die, he goes, that was fun. As his mind fades away and, and it flows through. And what scientists say that one of the last things to go when we die is our hearing and our, and our memory. Our memory starts as you know, as everything degrades downwards, as we lose, uh, uh, you know, oxygen into our cells and our brain shuts down. We can't handle it. Uh, memory is the one thing. So obviously, he's what we call about life flashing before our eyes, etc. So it's kind of interesting. So Mama uh, is there, and uh, the man goes to see her. The scientist goes to see her, and she is somewhat really quite ill and not moving and he talks to her for a bit he notices her and then after that then she starts to uh, kind of liven up and actually eats a couple of things from him and obviously she fades away uh, it's a, a very endearing incredible touching uh, um, event and I talk about the cross species aspect how lucky we are to be able to have dogs and cats live with us parrots and birds right cross species it's not a natural behavior in, in, in nature, right? It's not natural. And so this is an incredible uh, uh, opportunity, the gift that we have to be able to live with another uh, species, even though we are the apex predator, even though we are in charge, even though we can destroy the earth, which we are slowly doing with climate and so forth and, and the uh, depletion of, uh, of uh, resources. The ability for us to live cross species is, is pretty amazing, and, and I think that um, you know I, I kind of also think of, I guess I'm, I don't know why I'm on Star Trek now. I'm thinking of Star Wars, 
and I don't care which one you guys like because I'm not going to get involved. It's kind of like sports. Just shut your mouth, uh, James. Um, but, you know, the Star Wars thing about the Ewoks, and, and I remember when that came out, right, and, and, and people were saying, oh, my gosh, the Ewoks so cute. I, I wish we could have one. And then you see them all kind of somewhat friendly and, you know, being kept as pets and the, the idea of people here uh, who are watching the movie is talking about, oh, yeah, we'd love to have one. And the kids are like, oh, I want one, right? Um, but it's still that recognition, not only are they uh, a cross-species cohabitation, but they're a sentient being. And that sentient being, uh, be, uh, of the, you know, theoretical Ewok is, is that part, right? It's just how we kind of, um, find the need through our codependency to want to exist with nature, with everything around us. We want to be part of all of this. And what we see that even though it's not uh, uh, our, our species itself, we still want to somehow create a, a, a companionship or a care. Minky, stop. Enough. No. No. Not funny. Uh, that's Minky. Minky right there. That's Minky right there. All right. And uh, Minky will be leaving. Miki will be, uh, I'm returning Miki back to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. After uh, 15, 16 months, they've breached a contract with me, so I've said I'm done with that. I'm tired of getting taken advantage of, especially by giant organizations that don't follow through and keep their word. So uh, he is going back, and uh, it's going to be kind of sad, but you know what? He's stable. I did what nobody else could do down there, and um, um, the breach of contract, breach of agreement is, uh, is, is pretty disgusting, to be honest with you. And um, I'm just done with being taken taken advantage of um you know just really just disgusted by organizations uh that's a little bit of my rail you can hear the rail starting to come in so that's a little bit of what's going on slowly but surely uh you know i'm just gonna say that um uh yeah so getting back to the other part of it that the the cross species aspect that were so beneficially uh we're blessed to be able to do that uh, you know, and, and it shows sentience because there's no way that we can cohabitate freely. We have a, uh, we have dogs, cats running around in our home freely in the wild. This would never happen. Very, very rarely that any kind of cohabitation would happen. So we're very lucky to be able to have this type of uh, association. And that's why I always say to people, you know, why there's so many dogs that are being killed, six million dogs, because behaviors and scientists and master dog trainers they look at dogs as disposable that's why they went well we can't fix it because we don't care to understand it let's kill it let's kill the dog they kill it let he she it kill the dog and they call it euthanasia with youth which euthanasia it's only for putting a dog or a human out of medical suffering right and intense medical suffering is a situation and uh, whereas with a the dog there's no suffering Right, they talk about this uh, Erica Eden from uh, Eden Dog Training Academy. She, you know, like this most ridiculous, dumbest things. And I'm talking about her because she kicked me out of her group when I brought stuff like that up. And it's just one of the dumbest things in the world. She's back in Toronto, I think it is. Uh, one of the dumbest things in the world is this, uh, this, the term behavioral euthanasia. It's a scapegoat term for saying, I don't know how to deal with this dog's behavior, but the dog is suffering from behavioral issues because he's reactive or uh, Zevia won't calm down or whatever it is. It's like, you know, the dog, especially people who have adopted a dog or rescued a dog and the dog develops issues or has issues when, when, the, when we adopt them, the life that we're giving this dog, because you got to keep in context, before the, our adopted dog came into our lives they were in the shelter they were somewhere else they were in an abusive home or they were in a situation where it just wasn't tenable for the cohabitation of the human and the dog so they're given up or they're stray dog or you know like the formosa mountain dogs are really skittish dogs jindos etc are really skittish dogs and so what ends up happening is they're given up but when they're a stray dog is fighting for their life most times stray dogs don't live past two years of age because they're attacked by other dogs that are stronger, younger, and faster. They don't. You don't see a five or six year old old dog living on the street unless they're what they call you know a village dog or a community dog, where the dog will live in the area and be fed by the neighbors and the city people. I mean the people in the neighborhood and, and all that. The, the, the so we call it community dog. They call it. Um, but the dog that's a wild or stray dog is constantly on alert of not being killed. 
uh, looking for food. They're starving. They're looking for it, right? They're always skinny. And the dogs in the shelter, same thing. They're living in this horribly loud cacophony of noise that's bouncing all over it. And they're hypersensitive and I, uh, hearing. And I say, it's the same thing if you were to take your head, put it in a, in a steel garbage can, and then somebody out there starts smacking it with a spoon. Not even a hammer, but a spoon constantly. And see, this is what's happening to all this, this mental uh, suffering that's going on. I, you know, I always say the rescue is a shelter. You should put some egg crate uh, uh, sound absorbing stuff around the walls, especially at the top, to keep it from bouncing out. Because they say, well, we can't do it on the bottom, they'll rip it apart. Okay, I get that. But, you know, within reason. Um, so this lifestyle that these dogs are having before they come to our life is horrific. It's horrible. It's not ideal. You know, dog in a shelter is like being a person being in prison. It's it's horrific. Dog on the uh, wild is making sure that they have food, but also not being attacked by other dogs and other prey predators. When they come to us, we rescue them. And even if the uh, the dog, you know, like Minky or whoever, uh, they're in the corner hiding all the time, or they're just somewhat slowly coming out of their shell over weeks and months. People say weeks and months or months and all that stuff, right? Like I said, we can expedite that by just addressing the psychological issues, creating trust and bond. But the thing is, even if our dog is out there in the corner, and, and you know, and I've heard people saying things like, oh, it's too skittish and we have to, you know, he's not enjoying his life and da-da-da. Well, that's because you don't know what the heck you're doing, dude. But don't go recommend the dog to be killed because the dog is having behavioral issues like that because they're too skittish or they're reactive because they're, you're trying to get too close because we're trying to force ourselves onto the dog when he doesn't even trust us, right? And the thing is, the life that dog has before you decide, before these uh, Erica Eden and all these people decide to go say behavioral euthanasia, the dog's life is 10 million times better than he was out, than he on the street struggling to survive or in the shelter listening to this cacophony of noise 20 hours a day one dog barks they all start barking in the shelter so this behavioral euthanasia stuff is a scapegoat ease uh gutless uh, application by the scientists and behaviorists and those people who ever uses that term behavioral euthanasia are people who don't have any common understanding of life of context of life so i want to say that part um, even the dog who's aggressive, his aspect is where, what made him aggressive, what caused him to be aggressive, and then to transition towards being able to be in the home and addressing those things. And that's what I do, you know. Um, but again, keep in context. You hear the term behavioral euthanasia. It's garbage. It's a scapegoat term by scientists' behaviors, by people who just don't know what to do. And instead, they're just like, throw up our hands on it. Yeah, the dog can't be helped because I don't know what to do because we've tried all our tricks by throwing food at the dog, right? And yesterday, I bring up the same thing. Um, I, I talk about the fact that food does not exist anywhere in the entire canine species as communication, nothing at all. And in actual fact, right? Treat training is passive aggressive Pavlov, uh, you know, 122 years ago when people owned slaves. That's what Lima and APDT are relying upon all these other master dog trainers who talk about treat training dogs with dysfunction, behavioral euthanasia. They're, yeah, take some food. Hey, if I have a bad day and I'm having an argument with somebody, the last thing I want is for them to go, hey, yeah, James, stop, calm down. Here's some food. Here's a candy bar, right? Try doing that with your brother or sister when you're having a fight with them. Give them a candy bar. They'll start punching you in the face. Well, in my family, we're kind of rough with each other. But, the, right, it would happen. So it's like this ridiculousness that we're not having context. So that's why behaviors and, 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 and trainers and, and whoever, PhDs are saying the dog can't be fixed, need to kill the dog because he won't take food. It's like, wow, just, it's, 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 it's insane and it drives me nuts because... You just have to pay attention. You know, you help your friend heal, all that kind of stuff. I mean, like the other thing about food too, which I just, you know, when I brought up yesterday as well, is food is a, it, you, you're never going to see a dog bring another dog, you know, in the wild, bring another dog food, right? Even in your home, if you have more than two dogs, two dogs or more, you're not going to see one dog unless they're a mom, mom, you know, a, a litter and all that stuff like puppies and all that. You're never going to see one dog bring food to another dog. It's not, not, not normal. It doesn't normally happen. It's not a natural behavior of the, of the species or the genus, all right? You're never going to see the dog bring food over to the other dog. It doesn't happen. And in actual fact, 
in the wild or in here or even here in my home here, food is a resource. And a lot of dogs, especially the ones here who are dysfunctional, highly dysfunctional, that resource is something to fight over to the death. And those of you who have the dysfunctional dogs that have more than one, that have the resource guarding, when you see that happening, when one dog is eating something or even a toy, right, eating something, guarding something, the other dog comes by, immediately it's an attack on each other. Especially if the dog has that treat food favorite and then they see the other dog coming, they're like, and they, they go after them to keep them away. And then they guard it. They'll put the food right beside them. They'll guard it. So that's why I say this, this treat training aspect of it is just such an arrogant human thing to do. And then to say summarily, if the dog doesn't respond to what we're saying is a human uh, 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 um, theory, because it's not a theorem. Theorem means it's proven theory. It's just like, I think so. So if, it, if the dog... Anthony, stop it. If the dog doesn't follow through on on our theory, on the behavior's theory, then the dog can't be fixed, as uh, Dr. Ian Dunbar claims, and then the dog must be killed. And it's just it's just absolutely insane that this is what continues to happen. Um, but we're trying to fix dogs with food, and it's just like it's so crazy. And, and, and we're killing six million dogs. We, we all are, we're all part of it. Our politicians, we are all part of it. Six million dogs are being killed. Like, it's like, it's it's crazy. And it just goes on and on. And we're like, okay, well, you know, we'll just get another dog. Whatever, we'll just get another dog. And I guess I guess the point I'm trying to get to is, is just, we have to respect where we are in, in, in society and what our value is and what the dog's value is to us, cohabitation, co-species, right? Uh, cross, uh, cross uh, cohabitation and all that stuff. And, and we're not looking at the value that we have uh, for our dogs. So 6 million are being killed. The scientists behaviors are saying that. But here's the reality is dogs, we are killing dogs as if they're ants. I mean, 6 million, just in North America, we're killing dogs as if they're ants. And I say to uh, my owners in person, I say to them to give them a concept of understanding where we are and what we need to have in regards to empathy and connection and compassion with our dogs. Pretend that if, that we're the same size as, as an ant. Even though we're an apex predator, right? Apex being at the top of the food chain. We're an apex predator. But say, for example, there's an ant that we are, we're the same size as, as an ant. Or the ants the same size as us. Okay, we say the ants the same size of, of us, right? And that brings us back to the 60s and 50s of those ant movies that are monster ant movies. If we were the same size as the ant, we wouldn't be trying. We wouldn't be able to kill the ants because there would be too many of them, right? Almost a billion dogs, stray dogs, domesticated dogs, in globally, a billion. You know, I mean, there's a billion ants in probably like your city, our city, right? But there's a billion. So if there's a billion ants, we're not going to be able to kill a billion ants, will we? So what do we end up doing if we can't kill a billion ants? Human species, codependency. We try to figure out how do we work and coexist peacefully with these ants that are the same size as us. Then we have respect. Then we go, oh shoot, we can't go and kill this ant because then one billion ants will come after us. Then we start going, well, we have to figure out how to coexist. We have to figure out how to understand the psychology of the ant Yada, yada, yada. So that's what I'm saying, right? We have to figure out the cohabitation. So the other video that I uh, had posted here, right? Getting back to the circle that I, I'm always putting you guys on, and I appreciate your, your tenacity and, and, and being so faithful with what I do. Uh, and I had kind of changed the edit on it because it said, worship God while destroying everything that God created. It's part of the screenshot that came on it, and I recognize the fact that people are like, oh, this is a religious thing, right? But it's not, as per se. I mean, the guy talks about religion and so forth like that, and absolutely, that's totally cool. But what I said, there's a video a screenshot is not about religion, it's about human, and this is what his word is, uh, and I'm going to probably butcher it, Anthro anthropocentrism. Anthropo, you know, anthropocentrism. I can't pronounce it, but you you can see the word, uh, and, and it go, right. It's 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 what we talk about being non prejudicial to others and animals, right? We're like, oh, live equally and, and treat nicely and all that stuff. But the hypocrisy of the religion by some of those people in religion who are uh, somewhat taking uh, greater liberties than intended by the religion uh, itself, 
And so it's the need for us to realize we, we create an ethical confusion, societally speaking, right? We were, and this is what this guy's talking about. So it's not really from me. And this is two years ago. And it just came up with my memories. You know, we may, and I'm just saying on my words, we may be the species that controls all other species in this world, right? We are. We have ant killer. We have poison. We have we have ways of, uh, uh, you know, bring down uh, Amazon forests and, and, and everything. We have these ways of really just eradicating if it doesn't happen nicely and gently and we can't relocate, you know, with the bears and the wolves that come into the domesticated areas of the city, then we just basically shove them away. And if we can't shove them away, then we kill them. So, um, you know, we are the ultimate apex predator of the earth, yet we're the least beneficial. And so this 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 uh, uh, memory that I share from uh, activist vegan is the fact basically what this guy says Gary, uh, I'm just going to say Gary's the guy's name because I can't pronounce these words because uh, I obviously I'm I didn't pay um, enough attention because I just I, I just not into the language part of it here. But um, he talks about the fact that bees are such an important part of our global uh, existence, right? Our climate, our environment, bees without the bees, we're, we're you know, right? The pollination, all that kind of stuff. The other part he says too, which is why I kind of talked about it, and I've told this to my clients before, like I said, is ants. He said if the ants disappeared, it would our entire ecosystem globally would collapse, just like the bees. So he talks about the peaceful cohabitation, the respect of it, and not being creating a dissonance in, in perspectives of, of you know stuff like that. I'm not going to get into that part of what he says, but um, and it's a couple of minute clip for whoever wants to really watch it, um, but. It just talks about our ability to cohabitate. And when we cohabitate, we've just got to respect who, what we're cohabitating with. And if we're cohabitating with a dog, we have to respect the fact that the dog has a psychological context. Just like uh, mama bear, a uh, mama, the chimpanzee, there's an emotional context. And we may say, oh, well, because the chimpanzee has proven pri uh, more than just primate uh, behavior, but you know, almost human-like behavior, right? Anthropomorphization, but it's an emotional context. Uh, because of the the primate is showing a certain type of sentience and functionality, emotional functionality, logical functionality, then okay, we have to respect this part of it um, because of it, that's sentient. Even though there's still uh, legal aspects of trying to have uh, apes and chimpanzees given uh, limited legal rights in regards to recognition of uh, sentience, right? So that's still going on. Oregon, uh, uh, there's a Supreme Court thing that happened in 2017, 2018 that, uh, that occurred. I, I just kind of recall that now what we're talking. Um, but it, it just, when, when we look into the value of what the dogs are to us and we're cross species, we're living with them, they're living with us, they're relying on us. I mean, again, like I said yesterday, our dogs look up to us like you're my parent. That's what they really do. We have the ability to be, yeah, what we call alpha, which is ridiculous, uh, uh, brute force, brute term. But we're, we're our dog's parents. No ifs, ands, or buts. We take care of them. They're two to three old children type mentality. We're taking care of them. So we need to keep that into context of who and what we are. Um, and when we do that, and when we have the, uh, the context of it, then we understand how our dogs think. Right? Then the scientists start to shift things over into uh, a more realistic perspective. I already know that what I talk about is not going to be recognized for decades. I do. I already know this. So I'm leaving the digital legacy. You know, it's an hour. I mean, it's going to take people years to go through all the stuff once I'm all done. And, you know, I'm, I've left my footprint here. Um, but I know this. The stuff that I'm doing, even yesterday, I, there was three different people who came on, different walks, one online, one in, in person, another person uh, who I helped. Uh, they're all saying everything I said is right and everything I said works. And then they're doing it themselves. So I'm talking about that connection we have on a psychological level, emotional level. Our dogs feel it. We feel it from our dogs. We cry when our dogs die. We cry when our dogs are, are, are in pain. We feel it inside. You know, somebody talks about, you know, someone who loves their dog and, and all that, and they start talking about their dog. You can see in their face the pain that they have. The same thing as they uh, as we have when we talk about losing a loved uh, human being in our life. So I go from that basis, not only just from the experience of working with really dangerous dogs and all that, but from the experience of, well, what caused them to be like this, right? What happens? And it, everything affects them. 
everything affects them from from just uh, you know someone in contact me that I worked with on a on a group session uh, with second chance in life um, and I want to say thank you to Grace uh, for you know booking my whole month of weekends uh, for group sessions uh, for skittish dogs and all that stuff um, I really appreciate that I love the fact that you recognize that dysfunctional dogs can't be treat trained they have to be trained work psychologically otherwise you don't fix it you just giving a drug addict more drugs oh, here you go here's more food you don't you you, re, you retard the cognitive and logical ability I mean I've told people there's a few a few people who have dogs that you can tell their dogs are intelligent above average intelligent dogs and people are like wow well, you you know dogs are pretty kind of within the same envelope of intelligence no there are smarter dogs and there are dogs that are not as smart just like human beings and we all have that and and so we got to recognize that the variation that we we uh, you know science is uh, sorry i gotta look where i am science has put the the dog into this you know this this wide of a of a category envelope whereas with humans i was just going to scale it's it's off the screen right okay there we go now it's off the screen right it's off the screen it's so wide of, of birth for uh, the b-e-r-t-h birth of of the of our human personalities and and quirks and intricacies and all that stuff where the dog this is what they're saying this is it don't take the treat you're dead your dog's behaving bad bad dog take the training no training doesn't doesn't okay doesn't respond kill right but if we look at the dog on a psychological level like i do with everybody else um same thing which was with um jamie with her uh, her lab winston uh daxton and then um wyatt for those of you who watched like two, three days ago, it's got viewers questions, two, two giant dogs fighting, right? Is, is you, if you see the real time thing, she's saying you're right there, right here. And this has been the change in 18 hours. It's been amazing of the change and all, but it's not that part, just the shift on it. But the thing is there's a dynamic between the three dogs and the humans in the family itself that had to be addressed as one whole family, one whole team. So it's like the team that we have, you know, I've had a couple of businesses in my in my past and all that stuff when I was corporate and all that, and I've had employees and everything. And you got to manage just one person because if you don't manage this one, if I don't manage this one person in a certain way, that person over there will start going, oh, well, he's not doing it, so I get to, right? And, and it's all that. And I've worked with people as well, obviously. I, I can be a team player, I honest. Um, and when that happens, I have to be part of that part of our team and then the manager or the supervisor or the contractor is working with us or work or who's arranged it all who's supervising us has to tell me as in my unit to me about what I need to do my my role in the team same thing with other people and then he the the she the manager has to blend everybody together project leader has to blend everybody together and go okay you know what this is what we need and I got to make sure I got to do this. so this is all it's the same thing with the dogs we have to look at the management of our dogs as if it's part of our family. I come from a family of eight. My parents, you know, I wasn't the most uh, uh, obedient kid. I'm a bit of a rebel rouser, you know, <laughs> back then. Um, you know, even now I'm a little bit more whatever. I mean, I've talked before about the way I am. I, I like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm introverted, but uh, I also have that that key inside of me, which. We all have in regards to, we all have predatorial behavior inside of us. We do. Um, it's just that the ability for us to be have dominion over others or other animals, or whatever, right? The apex predator that we are. Um, but we still have to know how to manage. We still have to know how to take care of what we're in dominion of, what, what we're in control of, what we have ownership, so to speak, over. And we got to be able to blend that with our dogs. Our dogs have to learn from our management how they are in the family. Just like, again, my parents, eight kids. They had to make sure this kid is doing this, this kid's doing right. I mean, my oldest brother, uh, he had a double minor in math in university. And he's super young. My youngest brother is, a, is quite a, a successful lawyer um, in, in, in back east. right? And he speaks, I think he speaks eight languages now. I don't know how many languages you speak now. Um, and he does, he speaks it fluently, not just like blah, 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 uh, 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 like me, I can't even speak Chinese, I can't even speak French, um, but yeah, so, you know, my bookends of my brothers, uh, just absolutely brilliant, intelligent, genius, I mean, he's 152 IQ, this guy here's 166 IQ, my youngest brother, and I'm 
kind of not even in there, right? <laughs> Compared to these guys, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on my tricycle, so to speak. But the brilliance of all that part is my parents had to manage such high functioning children in our in our whole family, and they had to do it, and it was always taxing for them because they both worked long, long, long hours as immigrants usually do, and they still were able to kind of manage us, right? And of course, there's things that we I wish was differently, you know, all that stuff, just normal for any kid. I always wish I was a single, I was just an only child, to be honest with you. I was just like, I wish I was by myself. But, um, you know, the, the thing is that it still had to be management. Still had to be parenting that went on. Same thing with our dogs. Same thing, like I said to Jamie about uh, Winston Wyatt, uh, Winston Daxon and Wyatt, right? And the C. Nordy. I'm see, I have to remember the dogs in C. Nordy as well. I don't know the kids' names. I think she has four kids. You guys have four kids. But it's watching that. And it's, it's governing ourselves accordingly. And it's governing our children, dogs, human, children accordingly as well. So we create that management. And the biggest thing about this, is, so I'll get to the one part as I try to segue into it is regards to our dog not being involved in a fight because I've talked about that. I've talked about when you have a predatorial dog getting into a fight, you have to be very careful of trying to separate them because they don't, they're so isolated that they will turn and think that I'm part of it and then they will come after me because then they just target on evaluation aspect of it, right? Like favorites. Right, evaluation of the targeting on, on a predatory perspective. Um, but our own dog witnessing a fight is a really important thing for us to make sure that they're not suffering trauma. Some of you are shaking your head. It makes sense. If we see a dog fight ourselves, which I've seen plenty of them, one is too many already, but I've seen plenty of dog fights. Not with my own dogs, with other people's dogs. You go to the, we go to the dog park, right? Nobody can say, "Well, I've never seen a dog fight at a dog park or an argument between two dogs." I've never seen. It. Right? it happens to all of us. We've seen it. We've witnessed it. Even on the street, you see one dog trying to, you know, all that stuff. But when the dogs actually engage and they're fighting, and then we, you know, the 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 two uh, the two I call them owners, right? Because whatever the two owners separate the dogs and they're off and whatever exchange of words. And I mean, I think there's. There's just some drama that's going on with, with the local off-leash park here, too. But because um, there's somebody posting about it, and now they're getting it on social media, and they're uh, arguing with each other. Um, and the police are now involved because of some stuff that happened. Um, but, uh, okay, sorry. It's this kind of thing in that. It's so free-flowing here uh, in my head. Um, but when it comes to our dog witnessing a dog fight, same thing on our end. When we see a dog fight, it's traumatizing. It's vicious. And we're rah, 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 right? And they're all barking at each other. And it's all, and sometimes more dogs get involved because of the pack mentality that happens, right? That aspect of, okay, is this an interloper into our territorial aspects of it? A whole bunch of psychological issues. But, okay, so when we see the dogs fighting, afterwards we're like, holy cow, that was, uh, that was brutal, right? One dog is covered in blood or they're both covered in blood. One dog might be missing an ear or have a huge gash in them or several gashes in them and all that stuff and it's 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 horrific looking if we see two 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 guys fighting or two women fighting it's hor it's and one gets beat up badly it's it's a horrible thing to witness and it's even more horrible after because you see what ends up happening right one person's injured usually never that's why they lose and you're like holy cow um so our dogs are going to be witnessing it, the same thing as well and our dogs don't know how to understand it. Like they say the same thing, right? You know, I'm in somewhat in alignment with Temple Grand in regards to the sense of, you know, dogs, I mean, cows witnessing other cows being killed or hearing other cows being killed. Same thing with uh, factory farmed animals and animals in general, uh, the meat dog trade as well, right? They're seeing each other, uh, other dogs being killed in front of them. And it's traumatizing. Even though the dogs don't fully comprehend the aspect of death, the in in animation that occurs after death, right? Animation, in animation, after death. They recognize and hear the sounds of it. They hear the brutality of it. We can hear the brutality of it when, when two dogs are fighting. And if it's a vicious fight or if one dog dies, gets killed, we go like, holy crap, that was a horrible, oh my God, and the dog died too. 
And you should see the wounds and everything. And it's horrible to see the dog, you know, bring, right? I mean, to see a dog die is a horrific f experience, just like seeing a human being dying in that somewhat context. So our dogs, our, our little children are witnessing another dog dying or another dog being attacked. They're witnessing an act of violence, of course, which is not normal. And a lot of times you'll see one dog that like, and they start, you know, in a, in a group of dogs and they, they see something happen, that one dog, some dogs will kind of pull away and like, okay, I don't want to be in this group as much anymore. Or other dogs, well, yeah, totally cool and everything like that. The dysfunctional dog has already put themselves at risk of just being with us, right? You know, trusting us and all that stuff. They don't know how to process what's going on. And it creates in them more anxiety because in their heads already, the dysfunctional dog, the skittish dog, the reactive dog, it's already thinking to themselves as they're even before seeing the fight, he's just walking with them and driving them to the dog park or you're walking them on the leash. They're already amped like, okay, I, I got to be careful that another dog doesn't attack me and kill us, right? That's their fear of being attacked, right? The defensive measure of dogs. It's not a fight or flight aspect of it, which is uh, kind of amateurish, elementary in that part. But our dog is afraid of, our dysfunctional dog, Zevia, is afraid of being attacked. She doesn't want to be attacked when she's out there, so she's always looking around, like nervous, kind of like that. And she sees another dog, rah, 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 and she wants, wants to attack the other dog. That's the concern that Zevia has. So then, if, we, if I, when I take Zevia to a dog park and there's two dogs fighting, right? You know, everybody's all happy and everything. Zevia's playing around, and then all of a sudden you hear the dogs fighting, barking. Everybody turns. They turn to the sound of the fight. We can't avoid it. It's like holy crap, right? Because it's it's vicious. The sound of it is vicious. It's like having someone swearing at somebody else. It's vicious right away because it's untoward and all that. Um, yeah, I, I talk about that part in another one about how to kick a dog apart when, when that happens. Um, if the dog is going to be... Mary said, how do you get out of the situation when a dog is attacking you? I've, I've been there. I've been there home alone uh, for days and weeks and months alone. Um, for sustained aspects where they have attacked me, and then I'm still there with the other dog uh, that has attempted to attack me. And it's not just one particular dog that I had. It's other dogs as well that have all done that. And I'm always afraid. Opening the crate, you know, when I get them off the airport, I'm always, Minky, I was afraid. I had to put them in my car when they're trying to attack you. It's not, it, the, the reason the dog is attacking is because they're afraid that we're going to hurt them. Right? They're not going to attack out of the blue. The dogs are consequential. They're not reactionary. That's why I say the the the, the behavior and all stuff. They're 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 just silly. The dogs are reacting consequentially to the environment. Typically, if there's no there's no 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 trigger, then the dog's not reacting at all, right? There's no reaction. There's nothing. Something happens as a consequence of the environment changing. The dog then goes, ah, I'm going to defend myself. That's consequential. So that means if you're not creating any issue with your dog, to have them think that you want to hurt them or to impact their sense of safety or ownership, resource guarding, they're not going to do anything. So it's tempering your conduct around them. It's tempering what you're doing around them. It's making sure that you're not inviting it. And we have a pretty good intuition of not inviting things or not allowing things to get worse than they actually are, right? The minor little issues, if you don't take care of the little minor issues, then they become huge issues, and then they become significant issues, and then it results in the death of your dog by animal control. So just, uh, if it happens, I mean, see, with the dogs I have, um, when I intake them, they're not the dogs that's coming after me as per se. They, like I say, if I trigger them, right, if I cause them to be upset, then they will start to stalk me in the home. They know I, they know where my escape routes are. They know where the, I come in and out of the house. They know that. The dogs know our exits in our home. They know it themselves. How do I prove that? Well, really easy, right? You say, oh, well, James is not science-based. He, he's an idiot and all that stuff. How do you prove this? You see the video, and I've talked about this before, you see the video where the dog is sleeping in the living room and something in the ceiling starts to break apart and it's like a construction worker or contractor falls through the ceiling and the dog that's sleeping, totally asleep. As the person falls through, even before the person's even able to get up, the dog has already got up and run away out the proper exit. Even if there's two exits in this part, the dog won't run to this exit, even if it's a common exit, the dog will run 
to the next exit automatically. It's an instinctual aspect of it in regards to their defensive measures. Like I said, once we get further in, I'll start explaining a bit more com complicated aspects of uh, dog behavior, stuff that you've never heard about uh, because these people don't know what they're talking about in that sense of it. And I don't mean to be such a... I'm just so frustrated with, with just some of the dumb things I see and I've heard about today. Um, so then what ends up happening is that dog runs out the exit. He already knows, she know, right? He knows where to go. He knows how to escape. So if we create a confrontation for our dog, for what they perceive, and they're a dysfunctional dog, they're going to react to protect themselves. And to their mind, there's two things. Either they're going to give warning signs and so forth like that, overtly, physically, whatever, or they're not going to do it. No warning signs in there, or else, I mean, and they're just going to run away. And it's not fight or flight. It's just the dysfunction of the dog. It's the psychological processing of each individual dog. Because some dogs that are, like, for example, extremely skittish that would run away are also dogs out there that would just stay and react and fight. I, I have people who say, oh, you know, dogs really would never bite you, extremely skittish and all that stuff. And I'm like, that's not true. I think I was talking to somebody today, um, right? You know, I was talking, if you're watching, I was talking to you about... Um, um, I have to just kind of. Anyways, I won't. Actually, I won't mention it. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go on. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna say a little too much. But um, just when it comes to the attacking side of things, you already know where their tolerances are, right? You know how like with your friend, your good friend, you know how far you can push them to do something to go like you know like say they don't want to go see a movie, uh, a particular like you know. They don't want to see an action movie, and they're like, mm, come on, right? You know how to push them, but you know when they're like, no, I don't want to see that. You're like, okay, let's go see a horror movie. They're like, no, I don't really want to see it. Oh, come on, let's just see it, right? I love horror movies. Um, maybe because I have this, no, it's not a death wish, but I just love the suspense, and I love that loss of control, so to speak, where um, you just, you know you're safe because you're in the, in, the, in the theater, but it's just like that. letting someone else take you on a journey where you just go, oh my gosh, I could die. But I'm not, but I'm following the journey. Sorry. Anyway, it kind of goes with the dog thing and the predatorial aspect of it. Um, so I'm going to go back, right back again from my, my tangents. Um, regards to our, our dog. So Zevia sees a fight happening. Zevia sees the fight happening. She's going to be afraid. Guaranteed, after those two dogs fight, especially the one that wins or is evident that wins, Zevia's not going to go near that dog that just won. Watch that. Next time you're in the dog fight uh, situation, it's not going to happen because the dog that's won, or even the dog that's lost, but it's still amped, is still going to be livid. It's still going to be emotionally charged. The other dogs gonna be like, "Ooh, we can tell, right?" You know, you, you know how some people talk about like, "Oh, my dog just loves all the other dogs," and sometimes tries to help the poor dog that's really sad and tries to bring them out and tries playing with them. They can sense it. So can we, and they can sense violence as well. So then when Zevia sees something that's violent, she's going to be worried. And one of the things that my dogs have all learned is that if there's ever a situation, this is stuff I work with people who, to how to get our dogs to come to us when they're feeling anxious. Our, my dogs will come to me and they won't circle me as a protective aspect. They come to me and they stand around me in the point of, you're going to take care of us, right, dad? If, if anything happens, you're, you're going to defend us first. And that's why the predatorial, aggressive, dangerous, skittish dogs don't exhibit that type of behavior once they know it, that I'll protect them. So when Zevia witnesses two dogs fighting violently and blood's everywhere, it's important that I go and I help Zevia stabilize after the fight immediately or as soon as immediately after the fight. And it's not the one thing, like, oh, you know, you're okay, Zevia, it's just a dog fight, you know, the bad dog, the good dog, blah, blah, blah. I will bring her in, and I will spend some time with her. And I'll touch them, right? People know, people know me, right? I'll, I'll touch them in a certain place. The, uh, each dog has their own particular joy spot, just like a human being, right? We can tell when we're touching somebody in the right place by how they react to us, right? And so the same thing with our dogs. We can tell as well. We have to be really tactile and, 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 and intuitive of what's going on. So when the dog's come to me after the seeing fight, when Zevia comes to me after seeing the fight, 
even if she doesn't come totally to me, if she's not coming totally to me, then I know there's a trauma that's going on that's going to get a little bit more uh, concerning for her, even though she doesn't know how to process what happened, just other than that witnessing of the violence. So then I will, even if she might be 15 feet away from me and the dogs that fought were 50 feet away, um, so then she'll be 15 feet away. And if she doesn't come to me, I'll call her. If she doesn't come to me, I'll walk over to her and I'll touch her. And I'll touch her on her body, let her know that she's feeling okay. I'll talk to her and tell her she's okay. You're okay, Zevia. You're okay. You hear the tone of voice? I, I kind of bring a little bit of a, a somewhat uh, in, um, urgency and intensity in the voice, but I round off the, the words and I create a wave in the way I said, you're okay. You're okay. By creating that aspect, it causes them to listen more as the fluctuation and it's within a narrower envelope of tone. So that they're understanding the fluctuations there. There's not that strain in my voice. And then I touch them where I know where they like to be each touched in that part of it. So then Zevia will like to be touched in a certain place on her body. And, and other dogs will be, you know, the other dogs around me, I'll, I'll touch the ones that are mine or with me. And I'll touch them in a certain way. And then they, and I'll reinforce it. You're okay. I'll say their names. Be in a very calm voice, even though I've just seen something horrific myself. And I'm gonna have to like get a get a get a, get a couple of ounces of, of scotch in me. But the thing is, I'll see it happening. I have to like the same thing. I have to. You know, I've talked about in other 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 episodes. We get upset at our dog, but we have to bring ourselves right back down, even though we have to fake it. And I've had dogs that have attacked me, and then I have to bring it right back and I go, "You're okay, good boy, good girl." I have to bring it right back down, even though I can hit, feel myself. So when we witness this. And if we're already witnessing it and we're already feeling it and we can already process it and we can go, yeah, there's just dogs fighting. And it's horrible that one dog got killed or one dog severely injured, but it's two dogs fighting. Right. Our dog just witnessed two dogs fighting. Our dog just basically witnessed two human beings. Like it's me witnessing two human beings fighting viciously. So our dog, my dog, Zevia, knows and just saw a, a, a wicked fight amongst her own species. So I bring her back. If she doesn't come back, I walk over to her. I touch her. I'll give them the hug as I talk about everybody, uh, those people who, who do that. I do the reset with Zevia and let her know that's okay. And I talk calmly to her. I counsel her. I stay within the boundaries of the dog park. I don't leave the dog park because that also happens. You see people go like, oh, shoot, and they leave the, with their dog too because the other dog is still there or whatever. Don't. For me, I don't do it. You guys can do it. Disclaimer, don't do what I'm talking about in this thing. I'm telling you what my own personal experience is. So I'll stay there with Zevia or and how many other dogs I can bring with me at the time. Like it's usually two maybe because they're big. And so I'll hang out with Zevia and I'll just tell her, you're okay. And I'll, and I'll spend time. Just like your child having a nightmare. I'm just, I'm going to spend time with Zevia and go, you're okay. All right, silly girl. You're all right. You're okay. And I'll touch her and I'll hold her. And I'm not going to be rubbing her, trying to be like, oh, you're okay, right? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep her calm by holding her hand firmly, like I talk about that in other episodes. And then she feels calm and she realizes that I didn't get upset at what I just saw either, and that I didn't find there was a reason to be confrontational or to be uh, uh, um, uh, fearful of what happened either. I just go, hey, you know what? It just happened. I helped talk her down off of a different type of dysfunction that she might end up getting which we that dysfunction which then she becomes fearful of other dogs possibly attacking her because again she's like that was an unsolicited act of violence in front of me by my own species so i know it sounds kind of weird and, and, and strange and you've never heard this before nobody has nobody has ever talked to me about this and i tell them like yeah it makes sense right and i'm not saying I'm, the, I'm brilliant or anything like that i'm just saying it just makes sense so we want to talk our dog downward so that they feel like, oh, okay, dad saw exactly this traumatizing thing that happened and it's all right. Same thing with the dogs being killed. Meat dogs being killed in front of each other by these horrific butchers. Same with the factory farming and all that aspect. Of it. There's, there's no consolation on those end because it's just a terminal, uh, right? For the cow, it's a terminus, right? It ends. There's, there's no place past the, the, the slaughter aspect of it. But with our dogs, the place doesn't just end for them because they're conscious of it it goes on to the next step they don't realize whether or not the dog has died they just realize holy crud i just saw that and i don't want that to happen to me i become somewhat concerned about it. the dysfunctional dog 
I become concerned about that happening to me. If I go to this dog park again, I might be a little bit odd. It might take me a couple of days or a couple of visits to get over it. So by counseling them, giving them aftercare, we've all heard of aftercare, counseling. We want to help our dog understand that everything's cool and that we just basically spend the time to acknowledge it, reset with them, touch them, say their name, you're okay, right? You hear them, you're okay, right? Within the envelope. We create the aftercare, we reset them so that they become balanced. And I talk about resetting our dogs that have dysfunction, trauma, and behavior issues and all that stuff. By resetting our dogs, they understand, oh, you know what? It's all right then. Okay, dad, dad, mom, let me know it's okay. They didn't get too upset about it. And uh, yeah, they saw it, but they realized that I was scared too, right? You know, your child sees something that's horrible, like a car accident, and then, and then you come home and then what do they say? What happened to that man in the car? And you're like, well, you know, and you have to explain it. Because if you don't explain it, what is your child going to do? They're not going to have the ability to create a conclusion. They don't have a summation. They don't understand what has ended or, or not ended. They don't know what happened to the man in the car. So we have to tell them what happened. Either we tell them the truth or we don't tell them the truth. But we still have to tell the child what happened at the car accident. Or the man says, uh, yeah, he was just unconscious and he's going to the hospital. So, right? So don't traumatize them. We keep that context. Same thing with our dogs. And yeah, dogs can't communicate. Their only articulation that they have is physical, right? Primary aspect is physical. They can. Some dogs bark, some dogs don't bark. Oh, my dogs don't bark. Um, typically when they want to communicate because they just know it doesn't, they never get any of that back from them from their previous homes. So we just, we help the, our dogs understand through our own aspect of self-counseling them, ourselves and them, Hey, you're okay. And then we help them talk down. So that way when we go to the park again, they have the understanding like, okay, we've acknowledged that there was an incident that happened before and my dad is going to be there to, or my human is going to be there to make sure that if it does happen again, not only he's going to protect us, but he's also going to let us know we're okay. So then he had, then it creates another multi-dimensional aspect of, of, of taking care of the psychological aspects of the dogs. Like I said, and, and I can't remember when I said it, but I talked about the fact that everything I do, as simple as it sounds, because I used to talk quite complicated, and people were like, is this way too much for me? But what happened is when I start, right? Basically what it is, the stuff that I talk about sounds simple, but its application is multidimensional. It's quantum in its application because we ourselves are quantum. We have consciousness. Our consciousness is derived from the quantum processing of our logic and emotional processes, our drives, right? Again, that's my own theory. So, you know, anyways. But our, our quantum aspects of behavior, consciousness, we're thinking a million things, right? How many times have you thought a million things at once? Your brain is just like that. You're like, ah. So the same thing on our dog's end is the stuff that I do with them on our dog's end is I teach Ziga a whole bunch of different things about what's going happening. Yeah, I know I see that, um, Mary. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just low educated, uh, third world country type of people, peasants. Um, but an insecure uh, men who think that because of the dog meat thing there, right? Um, but okay, so getting back to the other part is we let our dogs know so that the simplest touches that we do has such reverberations, like taking, like, like Bruce Lee said, taking a pebble and throwing it into a, a still pond, a pond, right? The water is still, it's flat. You throw the pebble into it, the pebble hits the water and the ripples go on and the ripples go on and they go through all the whole shore and in, you know, in the circle aspect of it, right? It goes uh, concentric or whatever circles, it goes out and it just goes everywhere, but it keeps going because that one pebble causes everything to go on and on, right? You know, consequences, uh, multi-universes, right? Blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on and on. And that's what this part that we have to deal with when we're talking and dealing with our dogs in the most simplistic aspects of it. That's where we have the most impact in helping our dogs understand that trauma that they witness or that anything that happens, reactivity, that we, they're human, their parent, know what's wrong and we're able to address it for them in, in, in just that simplicity of our behavior with them. I know it sounds a little bit complicated. It's kind of like what I say to people as well. As, um, if you... You know, you're with your partner and you say, hey, you know, weekend, it's Friday, right? It's Friday now. You know, let's go watch the sunset. 
and like, oh shoot, there's a lot of traffic. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I said, okay, well, let's pack, you know, some wine, uh, pack some snacks, maybe something to smoke, right? You know, like that. And then let's go down, down to the beach and all that stuff and, and do it. But it's going to probably take us half an hour to get there, which would normally take us 10 minutes because it's nighttime traffic. And you're like, okay, let's just do it. Let's, let's leave early. We can make it. And we go down and you drive down. We're driving down and we're driving down. We're going through all the traffic. Oh my gosh, this is like this crazy anxiety. It's like all this traffic. Are we going to miss the sunset? before it hits the zenith and all that stuff, the sun, right? Like, rah, 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 rah. And then we get to the sun and we get to the beach. Fine. We're like, oh, cool. okay, let's find a spot there. And like, okay, we found the spot. There's nobody really here anyways. So we're there and we're sitting on the, on the, on the beach on our blanket. We got the, you know, the wines open in our paper cups and all that stuff. We're hiding because we know beach patrol, you know, so parks is going to be there. So we hide and we're there and we're just kind of hanging out. And then what do you do? You just sat, you sit there in, in almost silence and you watch the sunset together. The sun setting is the most simplest, simple, most simplistic thing to watch. You just sit there and you look at it and you it bring in this incredible amazement of what's happening from the universe. We just sit there and do nothing. And we enjoy, we absorb it and we recognize it and we register it because after that, we're like, wow, look at that sun. And we, after the sun, that wasn't that a beautiful sunset? It's the simplicity of it all. But what do we take in? What do we absorb? What do we what do we process? All the complexities that happen. The, the drive down, the drive back, where are we gonna go to eat, all that stuff, like the mundane parts of it. But we also viscerally feel it. Because we had all this anxiety beforehand getting down. We're we gonna miss the sun setting. I want to see it before it hits the water. We get there, we're like, oh my gosh, all this stuff has to wash through us. We go through the catharsis. We see the sunset. We're like, wow, that was beautiful. And what do we remember out of that simplicity of that act? How many people are out there who are married, long-term marriages, long-term relationships with a person you love, your soulmate, true love? Every single one of us that has experienced that or is experienced that or has been with somebody like that, you'll remember the sunset, that most memorable simple thing the sunset or the standing at the top of the peak of the the mountain looking down you remember the most simplest thing but like quantum in that aspect of everything that was around it to get to that point is the same thing that i do with the dogs everything that was there that little simplicity of resetting our dog and you're okay silly girl zevia you're okay it's all taking into account everything else that got us to the journey the end justifying the means so, just like at the end of the day, everything that you do for your dog, the trauma that you don't think your dog is experiencing or has experienced or is witnessing or has witnessed, has to be reset. That You have to bring them back to the simplicity of the fact that us here, our human, is taking care of them. Letting them know that they're safe. Letting them know that we acknowledge the potential fear and the trauma that they might be experiencing. And then they have a better sleep. Right? Dogs have nightmares. Dogs have emotional dreams. Dogs have logically driven dreams as well. Dogs have dreams of association. Dogs have dreams of us. We know this. So that's kind of like my little bit Friday flowery. I guess it should be flowery Friday and, and uh, Monday Monday week rants and all that stuff. But um, So I'm, I'm going to end it off on that because I'm like an hour in now. And um, my battery, I know, is going to die soon. I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in on a Friday. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to see the live vlog, thank you for watching it anyways. I mean, I'm you know, it's really cool. I'm getting like 200 views now on them versus like 20 views in the beginning. And I'm not even sharing it as per se because you guys out there are sharing it for me, which is just really just flattering. And it's really touching right and i was saying to somebody today on the phone and they said oh you know i i, I watched uh, your vlog yesterday and blah 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 and i'm like wow you watched it really and i and i'm like i'm just i'm humbled i'm flattered by it because it's it's finding a, a kindred or a kismet with with another person like you understand what i'm talking about wow you understand that dogs are sentient and believing and all that stuff Right, so I mean, 
I want to thank everybody, everybody for doing this and, and for following and, and you know subscribing to my YouTube channel and, and all these things. I am leaving a digital footprint. I don't know when it's my work is ever going to be recognized or may never be recognized or, or whatever. You know, I've had people um, express interest, but my ideals are a bit different, right? I mean, I'm looking at the simplicity of of, of the the life of dogs and. Um, my stuff is difficult for you're welcome Mary my stuff is difficult to explain to people because they're so used to the dogma of dog training treat training right you know every single dog is no treats every single one and people are like should we leave the treats at home what? yes yes just leave them at home we, we help people you picked up oh no i haven't you know what i, I, I was gonna do a meetup thing and then i realized it's a subscription service i'm like really i didn't know that it was a meetup was a you know that the meetup app um but i mean if somebody wants to organize a meetup at their place or something like that or you know at a coffee place just let me know i'd be happy to just to, to show up or and, and we can talk about stuff we can do a live coffee chat too or, or whatever um but yeah, I mean, I, I'm uh, I, I'm teaching people what I call the cure for cancer, so to speak, the cure for the epidemic of dogs being killed for behavioral euthanasia. I have the cure. Everyone who's worked with me knows this. Every single person, all my videos prove the same thing. In person proves the same thing. Online, look at the screenshots. Go to. Uh, free help for your dogs on my arf arf bark bark dot com website you'll see it Sc screenshot conversations that i'm having with people reading the descriptions of the dogs looking at the photos of their dogs and i went this is what your dog's personality is and this is how you dress your dogs and then they go wow right melanie hatfield yesterday same thing with jamie you know uh kim everyone's like yeah it works you're not bringing 20 30 dollars worth of treats with you every week you're having the proper leash as well right i talked to somebody else um uh, the same person today about uh, about changing their leash to a proper leash and they said once they changed it it was like amazing difference because we had to deal with the psychological issues that the dog has in regards to conduct and behavior on our end it's us we are the problem our dogs would defend our dogs would defend us to the death we are the problem because we have disrespect for our dogs. And that's the truth. It doesn't matter. You go, oh, I love my dog. And then you take care of my Yeah, absolutely. But we need to respect our dogs in the same cognitive and emotional process that we do with children. That we demand of ourselves from others. That's that type of respect and the comprehension and that connection that we have to have. You know, I've written down in one of my things is whether or not there is or is not a God... Whether or not we are just a random fluke in this universe as, uh, um, um, oh shoot, I can't remember, He's a, he died, right? Um, Stephen Hawking said, right? We're random. Even if we are out of the billion, 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 Google billion number, etc., right? Infinity numbers. Even if we were, it's up to us. No matter how small it is, it's up to us on this incredibly random planet again if you don't believe in god and, and like i say i'm i'm not exposing it either or, I, or proselytizing it uh, uh, religion but i'm saying even if we were just a fluke it's still our obligation as the apex predator as humans as the the the, the top of the food chain to do kindness to others We have this rate, like this is what that, that, that guy said in that other second post that I shared from my memory in regards to speciesism. We have to recognize these things about us, what the damage that we're doing on purpose because we have a callousness. Right? I mean, there's, there's just so many times where we're just so superficial. We send a text to somebody and we're like, okay, they haven't responded back. Uh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> it's like, oh, just wait four minutes. We live in this technology. We're a technological driven species, as I've said before. So we're just driving ourselves insane with these things, but we're not looking at the stuff. 
that's around us, the, the, the people that are around us. I mean, you know, our, our friendships in life have become even less and less important to us or less and less valuable to us. And our circle has become smaller and smaller and smaller. We become more core with a group of small core of people when in the past, you know, the old days in the, you know, even the early 1900s or mid 1900s, we did stuff for each other in the neighborhood. We have our uh, crowdfunding and we have our social media for, for, for desperate situations. Of course we do. But as human beings going out the door, you know, even like that neighbor down the street won't help us if we had a fire, go, you know, like that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's a part. Actually, I want to talk about the one thing that um, is on my notes here. Our complicated language made us less sincere. The old days. Our, our, our language, our lexicon, our unabridged dictionary of English words, our unabridged, right? I mean, I think that's supposed to be like uh, adjectives. There's like over four or five hundred different adjectives that are commonly used in our in our conversation on a daily basis, right? It's crazy the amount of language there, that we have. And in the old days, right, the old days, before I was born even, people were just like, just talking and they didn't use lots of language they were very frank you knew the people were like yeah that guy just you know that guy doesn't he just tells you what he thinks he's not going and using uh, words like uh well you know okay i i do it as well but you know he's not using words like obfuscation and all these other aspects of psychogenetic aspects of it when he's talking about you know just going to the grocery store i'm going to the grocery store i bought this and that and oh did you buy that no i don't need it why didn't you buy it because i don't need it I right? didn't go and say, well, I went to the grocery store a while. I might go and wait to see when it's better on sale because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pay too much money for this product. I want to wait till, you know, I see it on the flyer. I'll go to some people, go to Costco to buy it instead because it'll be cheaper there. Right. We, we kind of get all flowery and then we create our language even more complicated by having definitive words that are um, not um, not as kind as conveying our compassion or our concerns. Like you see the stuff that's going on in uh, um, in politics right now. And you see, uh, who cares what side of the bipartisan, partisan, who cares right now? But you see how some of the conversations that uh, when asked by, by reporters, well, what do you think of this and this? And then the person, you know, internally, you can see in their eyes that they're absolutely like aghast at it. But then instead, what do they say? They're like, well, you know, we believe this is this is this. this. And it's like that all this flowery, complicated language to just obfuscate, to cover up, to make it, to shadow out the true emotional intention that we have. Because we're not connecting. We don't want to connect. We become disenfranchised. So we have our own little core group of friends or, or people that we trust. And that's it. And it's, it's this little, sorry. It's, this, yeah. it's, like, it's like this little circle. And that's it. We just keep it there. We don't share. We don't try to do anything. We're just, we're, we're stuck in our little, our little envelope ourselves. So, anyways. Um, I should go because uh, it's like 940 and... My dog is going to want to eat and stuff like that. It's Friday night. I'm going to go probably watch a movie here uh, with them all. Um, I want to thank everybody again. Please share my stuff. You know, if you have any uh, topics for the future, uh, you can see I always have topics here, but sometimes it's just like, oh, you know, whatever mood strikes at this time. Um, there's no topic that is is bizarre or crazy. I mean, for those of you who are still watching in at this point in time, I mean, I know what, what dogs think when when – they see us masturbate, right? Okay, there. I know what they think. And when you hear it, it's just like, yeah, that makes sense. Right? All these, you can ask any question, whatever you want. It's really quite simple. Because um, we just think about it as a dog. And I've been thinking about dog in the dog perspective through some extreme times and, and, and lengths of time and, and confrontations from them. Uh, from me, not confrontations, just the reactions to me and, and behaviors and, and and so forth. I've learned these things that have happened and I'm happy to share with everybody. I have to share it with everybody because if I don't share it, it's going to get lost and no one's going to learn and there probably won't be anyone like me for 50 years. There hasn't been anyone before like me, Pavlov, and then, uh, you know, uh, B.F. Skinner. All that stuff's been debunked, debunked, proven as false. And then Lima's relying on it and BCSBC is relying on their same debunked uh, aspects of it, the same thing. It's just, right? There's been no one be before me 
chances of someone like me coming afterwards, and I've talked to some, like I say, Alan Shelton. He's, a, you know, he used to be he used to work for uh, Amazon as a vice president uh, with Vans and all that stuff. It's a great inspiration to me. You know, we we've talked on the phone and all that stuff, and the reality is, even he said, uh, it's you know, other people have said too, is it's unlikely that there's going to be anyone like me after me. So my obligation is to, to share what I can. And I ask, you know, I, I always ask, please share my work. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, right? Uh, you know, people contact me for free training. I do it yesterday, the day before, and all that stuff. I'm happy to help if, if it helps save someone's dog. And the people then comment back and say, you know, I tried what you said the other day, and it worked. Right? we got to share. we got to help. We gotta do our part in this earth. Is that one little bit, you know? Um, I I had a corporate life before, decade plus ago. Then I, I ran my own business and all that stuff as well. I could have been successful financially if I if I had, but I was really um, distraught that I wasn't making a true change. And I'm blessed by God to have this uniquely rare gift with dogs. To be able to read them at two tenths of a second, and my accuracy, right? Anyone who knows me, my accuracy is a hundred percent. That's that's the scientists' behaviors. Their, their accuracy's success rate is less than sixty percent across the board. Mine's a hundred percent. So it's it's like this is given to me. This is something I've developed. It doesn't matter where you want to say it from. It's something that has to be shared. I have the cure. For cancer in the epidemic of dogs being killed I do I have that cure and I'm proving it 100% of the time and that's why I get kicked out of dog training groups all the time like I'm not even going to them anymore because it's like uh, eventually they find out who I am and then they kick me out only way my words gonna get out is by social media by uh, yourselves not looking for fame or fortune. I'm looking to save all these dogs' lives that are just being killed needlessly. This behavior, euthanasia stuff, and all this, this silliness, and the, the silly people like Erica Eden and, and uh, saying the dumbest things. Ian Dunbar with his really childish bite level scale that has no real foundation in, in dog behavior, psychology. It's all the stuff that they're grasping. Like I said, it's, all these people are, are riding a tricycle with two wheels. When I read the stuff that they talk about, it's, it's like listening or reading what a child tells you why the sky is blue. Yeah, you're welcome, Sammy, right? And I'll get to your uh, the group PM uh, uh, late tonight. I've got a whole bunch of things to still catch up on uh, with uh, with uh, Riley, right? With Riley and <laughs> through faith. And I mean, and aloha, aloha to you in Hawaii. Uh, you're so lucky. Um, actually, Alan lives in Hawaii too, so... Uh, there must be something really cool about Hawaii. Uh, yeah, I don't even go. On, I don't go anywhere. I don't go on vacation. I don't go anywhere. When when my uh, beloved Nero was alive, I, I didn't dare leave uh, in case I was gone and he died without me. And I would just that would have been um, really horrific for me to 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 live that experience. Um, and I'm gonna get to that one part. I'm just, it's really hard for me to get to the the one topic that I want to talk about. Two topics. Uh, interrelated is that part of you know um, how to prepare yourself for your dog dying and how to prepare your dog for their death as well and um, that's something uh, uh, Debbie Martin her husband Mike uh, Michael uh, very very dear friends of mine you know uh, invited me over for Thanksgiving and you know hopefully you guys can invite me over for Christmas dinner as well with your family and all that um, like a whole bunch of people so it's just not me um, you know the year before over a year before Nero died well a year before Nero died I, I was telling Debbie this is what I'm doing to prepare for Nero dying and for Nero to, to be prepared for when he dies and when I explain it you're just going to go wow that just makes so much sense it's not the bucket list it's just this Really think, but it's hard for me right now because it's still really painful for, for uh, a number of reasons. Um, 
you know. If there's anybody out there who's a writer, actually, I'm just going to shift it because I don't want to just start crying or anything like that. But, um, yeah, you know, uh, Nero the Great Dane. Okay, so if you go to my um, arf, arf, bark, bark .com, you're going to see a memoriam, uh, somewhat of a eulogy that I wrote about Nero. It's a brief thing. I could have gone on much longer. Um, but if you go under the home page tab and you, you just hi hover over it, then you see it say Nero the Great Dane, Nero Chai the Great Dane, and then you'll read what I did. And some of the things I did to help Nero survive, plus CBD oil from Hemp My Pet and Glycoflex uh, uh, Level 3 uh, for senior dogs and, and reducing his weight. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can see my photos. I have one Dane before Nero, my beloved Lincoln. I have him in a wheelchair because he, he became paraplegic. Like, all the stuff I talk, I don't just talk about it, it's, I actually do it. You know, I was doing urine catheters for Lincoln, and that's really difficult to do, because you have to insert the little urine catheter into his urethra, into his penis, and then thread it through, and you can feel it. And as a guy, you can feel it, like, oh, yuck. Uh, Nero had to express his bladder uh, last, uh, almost the last two months of his life. Absolutely CBD oil. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. You don't, you don't want to know what, have you heard of the company... I know I'm going way over. Um, you know the company Discount Tire. Okay, we've all heard of Discount Tire, right? They're online as well. Discount Tire. They actually lobbied uh, back in I think 2016 or 2017, like over a million plus dollars against legalizing uh, uh, medical marijuana and CBD oil. I saw that in my memories today. It's the only reason I remembered it, so I don't have this great memory. I just I saw it in my memory. I was like those sons of a beeps. Right, so I was like, oh, I was gonna share. I was like, oh, well, I don't want to create controversy. You know why? They're they're ready. It's legal now, or in most states, or uh, some states, and some and some pro Oh, in Canada, it's legal in Canada to smoke up, um, which is kind of funny. Um, you know what the thing is? Actually, it's so funny with the with the fact that you know marijuana is legal in Canada that you can smoke it and all that. I bet you, you, you know, you'll never find a, a marijuana butt on the floor because all these guys are like, oh, that's a marijuana joint. Let's keep it. Let's roll it. Let's you know use the roach and all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, you know, I, I, and I, I, you know, you guys heard me earlier to say this, I'm just going to roll on a little bit more, you know, of course I smoke up every once in a while and all that, and, um, and I've never done any other drugs or anything like that because I was just too afraid of losing control, but, man, it's the only thing that slows my brain down, it, it's just, it's the only thing that slows my brain down. Because uh, I was just seeing everything so fast, but it's so cool. Because I've had people who I've talked to, uh, right? And then they're like, "Dude, how do you even see that? Right? How do you even notice this and all that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, well, you know, I see the dog do this and this and this, and this is why the dog's doing that." And like, okay, okay, cool, all right. So let's just get you some pizza so you stop talking about it. And we're going through, uh, but some guys, uh, you know, hang out and it's just our conversations. Just, it's just gorgeous, right? Because we're just talking about everything, and it's always a good mood. I'm never, I'm not the person who who sees things angrily when I'm like that because it's like why it's just having fun it's enjoyable um anyhow okay so uh thank you all I'm gonna sign off I go to the bathroom <laughs> and uh, uh I gotta feed my guys because they're gonna be really they're they're used to the fact that I'm feeding them really late no they're not too happy anymore You're, what did that say well, great anyway yeah you know why you know why she comes running Sammy because <laughs> she knows there's food involved within seconds of it right Mama's got the snacks. Mama's got the munchies and everything. Um, you know, the, the CBD oil, whatever, all that stuff, it's, it's just a phenomenal uh, thing. It helped Nero live two and a half extra years longer. I thought it was only going to happen for three to six months. I was like, I wanted an old Dane that was dangerous for two reasons. One, to give him a better life, and two, because I knew if he died uh, soon, I wouldn't be as emotionally attached because I had just lost my beloved Lincoln. Uh, when I a week later I started looking for another Dane because I needed to tribute Lincoln's life, and that was the best way was to save another life with the move of the passing of Lincoln. Then it came Nero. There's a whole story behind this whole thing, and it's just a, a tough thing. Whole whole bunch of things. Um, gonna end it. Gotta feel it. I got cat food. If anybody has a cat here in Vancouver and needs it, uh, Christina, if you know uh, anyone who wants to kind of get together and we have a coffee thing with a bunch of people, whatever and talk about dogs and all that stuff for a couple hours is all cool as well uh, i'm in group sessions tomorrow saturday and sunday i want to thank uh, second chance in life foundation again for that and and you know understanding the dysfunctions of dogs can't be treat trained um i want to thank um yeah everybody for just following just bearing with me as i um uh, leave my digital footprint here 
uh, for that the rest of life can um, realize that we got to do more for our dogs and we can and uh, got the cure for cancer right here for the for what's killing our dogs take care everybody happy friday and we'll talk to you tomorrow bye bye